All right, everybody. Good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. My name is Justin Curtis. I'll be leading us in the liturgy this morning. Micah and the band will be leading us in singing. Uh, receive, reject, or redeem, right? Those are the three options that faithful Christians have when it comes to engaging culture. We can either receive things as they are, we can reject things because of what they are, or we can redeem things through the lens of the gospel. Friends, St. Patrick's Day is a day worthy of redemption. Uh, because it, cre yeah, okay, you can clap. You go for it. Because it allows us an opportunity to honor arguably one of the greatest Christian missionaries that ever lived, St. Patrick. At age 15, if you're not familiar with the story, at age 15, St. Patrick was kidnapped. He was not St. Patrick then, he was Patrick. Um, but he was kidnapped by a band of Irish slave traders and taken over to pagan Ireland to be a slave. He was there for six years. During that time as a slave, he came to know Jesus Christ, submitted himself to him and became a Christian. At age 21, uh, prompted by a dream, he escaped Ireland and fled back to his homeland of Britain. Years later, again, prompted by the Holy Spirit, Patrick returned back to Ireland to the very people who had enslaved him to go and to preach the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. Listen to this quote from St. Patrick. He said, I came to Ireland to preach the good news. I have had many hard times, even to the point of being enslaved again, but I traded in my free birth for the good of others. If I am worthy, I am ready even to lay down my life willingly and without hesitation for his name. Here in Ireland is where I wish to live out my final days, if God will permit me. I would love to go home to Britain to see my family, but even if I wanted to leave, I am bound by the Spirit of God who would object and condemn me. I can't leave unfinished the work I've begun. Christ, my master, has commanded me to stay here in Ireland for the rest of my life. Friends, within 200 years of Patrick's life and ministry, Ireland was known as a Christian nation. St. Patrick devoted himself to the work of making disciples and planting churches and spurring gospel renewal everywhere. The very same thing that we give ourselves to here today. So for those of you who are newer to Coram Deo, who are interested in getting caught up in that same mission in the legacy of St. Patrick, let me uh, give you a few easy ways for you to get more connected to our church this morning. First, you can sign up for our weekly update email. It goes out every Monday morning, lets you know all of the happenings and what's going on within the life of our church. Uh, you can uh, send an email to our connections team at connect at cdomaha.com. Uh, and somebody from that team would love to reply back to you and help to get you connected. There will also be uh, leaders, volunteers near the connection desk after the service wearing green name tags. Uh, they can help connect you this morning and let you know what's going on in the life of our church. And uh, something that's going on about two weeks from now is that uh, the Saturday before Easter, we are hosting a Holy Saturday baptism celebration. So uh, if you are interested in learning more, wanting to know more about baptism, interested in, in getting baptized, See one of the leaders wearing the green name tags. Grab me after the service or Mike Kresnick. Man, we would love to answer any questions that you may have. Um, also, uh, we do not take an offering uh, during our church service. We trust that if you're a Christian and this is your church home, that you're giving generously to the Lord. There's a tithes and offering box uh, near the doors on your way out. And a quick financial update for those of you who have been tracking with our Facility 2.0 project. To date, we are over 25% of the way there, which is good news, something worth celebrating. I just want to encourage you. Yep. Let's continue giving faithfully towards that end as well. Uh, we will have leaders available up front after the service to pray uh, for you if there's any needs this morning that you're bringing in here or if the Spirit does anything. Uh, but now what I want to do is I want to invite you to stand. Uh, so go ahead and stand. And hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Isaiah calling us to worship this morning. I am the Lord, and there is no other. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And let's pray this prayer together. 
We will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will sing your praise.
together now and confess our sins using the words on the screen. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have failed to live under his lordship and to honor him with the fullness of our lives. Forgive us, we pray, and raise us from sin to the new life of righteousness through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Take a quiet moment now to individually confess your sins before God. Hear now God's words of pardon and peace from Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Because of God's great mercy, our sins are forgiven in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. Rest in it this morning and be at peace.
Patrick's confession is what we're going to use this morning for our profession of faith. Uh, this was a confession that he wrote to catechize the Irish and help them to understand the Christian faith. And friends, it's a long one. Let's do this. We profess that there is no other God. There never was and there never will be. God, our Father, was not born, nor did he have any beginning. God himself is the beginning of all things. And we proclaim that Jesus Christ is his Son, who has been with God always, from the beginning of time and before the creation of the world, though in a way we cannot put into words. Through him, everything was created, both what we can see and what is invisible. He was born as a human being, and he conquered death, rising into the heavens to be with God. And God gave him power, greater than any creature of the heavens or earth or under the earth, so that someday everyone will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. We believe in him, and we wait for him to return very soon. He will be the judge of the living and the dead, rewarding every person according to their actions. And God has generously poured out on us his Holy Spirit as a gift and a token of immortality. This spirit makes all faithful believers into children of God and brothers and sisters of Christ. This we proclaim. We worship one God in three persons by the sacred name of the Trinity. Add away. Great job. And amen, right? Amen. amen. Hey, if you're a fourth or fifth grader, you are released now to go to the catechism class. Uh, Andy and Katie Holtz are out there ready to greet you and welcome you uh, into that uh, catechism training. That class meets the first and third Sundays of each month. And if you have a fourth or fifth grader and want to learn more about that, uh, Bree is out there along with some other Cormdale Kids ministry people who can help kind of inform you. Parents, reminder, after the service is over, you'll be able to grab the kids uh, out of the library, which is just across from the atrium over there. All all right, so now that there's a little bit more space in here, uh, go ahead and take a moment to turn and greet one another in the name of the Lord this morning. All right, friends, I want to invite you to join me in prayer now this morning. Uh, every Sunday, well, most every Sunday, we have the privilege of praying for one of our church planting partnerships. And this morning, we get to pray for Pastor Femi and uh, City Church in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, Lagos is a, a large global city. Femi is a great uh, leader of the gospel. And we want to just continue to be praying for them and for the advancement of the gospel in that part of the world uh, and, and really praying that the Lord would meet them as they anticipate uh, being able to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a couple weeks on Easter Sunday. So we're going to pray for them as we do ourselves. And as I get started, I'm going to uh, take some of the words from St. Patrick's prayer. Uh, and I want to invite you uh, to be, to, as I'm praying these words, to be receiving them as your prayer this morning as well. So join me as I lead us in prayer. And then obviously towards the end, we will conclude by praying the Lord's prayer together. So Heavenly Father, I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through a belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation, I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth and his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion and his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension, 
Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me, I arise today. So Lord Jesus, would you strengthen by the power of your Holy Spirit all the saints at City Church in Lagos, Nigeria, as well as Pastor Femi and his family. As you walk with us through this season of Lent, preparing us for the celebration of your resurrection on Easter Sunday, would you too walk with City Church? Deepen our repentance. Strengthen our faith. Convict us of our unbelief. And prepare our minds, bodies, and souls for the joy of Easter morning. Where we are cynical, give us hope. Where we are apathetic, wake us up. And where we are discouraged and defeated, give us the surpassing knowledge of your love. And now as your people, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 32. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. The word of God for the people of God. I want you to imagine a completely fake scenario. This is completely made up, so it's 100% false. And here's the scenario. 
Imagine that you wear the same outfit every single day. <laughs> Not only is it the same outfit, but it's the same color every single day. Now imagine that you wear the same outfit that's the same color every single day, and one of your coworkers is trying to get you to wear something different. Just change it up a bit, they say. In fact, they're willing to buy you a completely new outfit with a variety of different colors, and they're willing to spend more money than you've ever really spent on any of your outfits. Now, what would you say to this person if they refused to put on the new? You might think they're foolish. Come on, man, like put on the new, take off the old, it's free. Now, this hypothetical scenario breaks down because in my telling, it's actually better to resist the tempters who are trying to get you to wear something that doesn't fit you. But in our text this morning, Paul tells the Ephesians to put off something that's old and to put on something that's new. Put off and put on. Now, if we haven't met yet, my name's Aaron, and I have the joy of getting to be a part of the team here at Coram Deo. And this morning, you've just heard the teaching text read, we're continuing on in our series, the book of Ephesians, the last half here of chapter four. Put off the old self, put on the new self. That's what the text says right in the middle of the passage we just heard read, verse 22. To put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, before we go any further, there's something I want, I want to point out. When Paul is talking about the old self, he's talking about the old identities, the old humanity, the old way of being human. And when he talks about the new self, he's talking about the new identity that Christians already have been given in Christ. He's talking about a new way of being human. In fact, in verse 22 and following, the word self is the word anthropos. It's the word for human. And Paul has already told the church in Ephesians in chapter 2 that Christ has made for himself one new man or one new kinds of humans. So as God is renewing all things in Christ, the main way God's renewal comes about is God renewing dead and dying sinners and giving them a new identity to live as new kinds of humans. God in Christ makes sinners new, and because of Christ, there is a new way to be human that each of us in this room is invited to put on. Let me say it like this. There's something that I want each one of us to get here in this room. A Christian must put off the old and put on the new in order to experience the new way of being human. And this is what I want to talk to us about this morning, the new way to be human. A Christian must put off the old and put on the new in order to experience the new way to be human. And I want to talk to us about this in three movements. First, what the new way to be human requires, what the new way to be human often misses, and what the new way to be human looks like. So what the new way to be human requires, what the new way to be human often misses, and then third, what the new way to be human looks like. So first, what the new way to be human requires, 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, notice verse 28, or sorry, verse 18. The text says that people are alienated from God due to their hardness of one's heart, or the, even the callousness of one's heart. See, if you're new to the Bible, whenever the Bible speaks about the heart, it's talking about the core control center of the human person, the core place where your motivations and desires and longings are all formed. 
As I've heard it said before, the direction of our lives is determined by the state of our hearts. And in verse 19, the text even says that their hearts are callous. Think about how something gets hard or callous. A wound can harden to the point where there's an absence of feeling. It can become callous. And maybe for many of us, you don't actually know what's going on in your heart. It just feels dark. That many people have maybe experienced wounds and hurts, but if we operate from a place of woundedness, there can become a real danger of our hearts becoming callous and hard. You may have a wound, maybe from the sin of others or from your own sin, but there's still a wound. And if that wound hardens without there actually being healing, it can lead to an absence of feeling. You begin to neglect to actually address your heart, the deepest part of you. You're more numb to God and numb to others, others, and it's hard to understand what's going on in your heart. See, we need to talk about the danger of our hearts becoming hard toward the Lord. As God's people, we must acknowledge the ways that we're prone to becoming comfortably numb. See, but regardless if that's you or not, let me ask you this question. How's your heart? No, really think about it. How is your heart? How is that deepest part of you? See, maybe when I ask the question, the first thing that you want to respond with is, I'm struggling with this action or I'm tempted by these thoughts. But that's not the question. The question is, how is your heart? Go deeper. See, we often think that if I can just fix this behavior or fix this habit, then I can live as this new way and this better way of being human. And while behavior and actions do matter, that on its own will never lead to the ultimate transformation and healing that the Spirit of God wants to bring. The ultimate answer is not simply fix your behavior. The ultimate answer is let God fix your heart. Or better said, let God give you a new heart. And we need to allow the love of God to soften our hearts, which, yes, in turn, will impact our behavior. See, don't you see what the text is saying? What the new way to be human requires is a change of heart, a new heart, that God is after more than just your behaviors and thinking. He wants all of you. He wants to make you a new kind of human from the inside out. And this starts with your heart. And what the the text is saying is that the new way to be human requires a change of heart, a new set of motivations and desires, a new power to actually bring about the transformation and healing we're all after, a new vision for your life where you actually want to respond to the Spirit of God leading and guiding you. But a new heart can only come about through one particular way, which leads to our second point. What the new way to be human often misses. Take a look at 20. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. When Paul says, learn Christ, this is the only time in the literature of Paul's day where someone writes about learning a person. Every other time this word learn is used, it's attached to learning a skill or a book or idea or a list of rules, but you don't learn a person in Paul's day. But you got to see that Christianity is different. Christianity is about learning Jesus. It's about a person. Not about learning a set of rules, not learning a list of to-dos, not even learning a list of abstract theological principles. It's about learning Christ. It's about encountering the person of Jesus. And we often can miss this. It's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that Christianity is simply about showing up to church and reading my Bible and attending GC each week, all great things, but those things are a means to an end, with the end and the goal being Christ. The goal is to encounter and know and love Christ. Don't miss this. 
And when we really know and love Christ, when we sit in his presence, you will want to learn from him. You will want to become more like him. See, friends, if we miss this, if we short-circuit this and miss the importance of learning Christ, of encountering and savoring the person of Christ, then we're just left with lifeless religion. The list of things that Paul is going to talk about at the end of this chapter are just going to feel like another list of religious to-dos. The new way to be human can't miss that it is fundamentally about learning the person of Christ. But there's something else the new way to be human often misses. Look at 22 again. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. I mentioned this already at the beginning, I think it's worth repeating, that language of old self equals old human. Again, that word for self is the word for human. Paul is saying, put off the old way of being human. But think about who Paul is speaking to. Paul is writing to Christians who know and love the gospel. Which means discipleship to Jesus is always a journey of continually putting off and putting on. It's an ongoing process. A Christian is one who is in the daily process of putting off former identities, false identities, former ways of living, and putting on the new way to be human in Christ. Learning Christ is about reclaiming our humanity in him. That the old way of being human may be That cultural script or that family script that you've been handed and that has become your identity or that old way of being human may be the ways that you're tempted to be a self-made human. Tara Isabella Burton in her recent book, Self-Made, says, our economic, cultural, and personal lives are suffused with the notion that we can and should transform ourselves into modern-day deities simultaneously living works of art to be admired by others in ingeniously productive economic machines. Burton goes on to argue that to be a self-made human is to seek to build your identity based on your desires. She traces how we got to this cultural moment where all our identity making is often rooted and based in our desires. Our desire to be self-made often rules us. And as I was reading her book, I found her argument fascinating, especially in light of this text. Because verse 22 tells us the old way of being human is corrupted through deceitful desires. See, many desires are not bad in and of themselves. But the problem is that the desires we often do have deceive us because our hearts are sinful. Our desires trick us. Our desires make us think that if we have that thing that we really want, then I'll be truly happy. If I had that person or if I had this other person, then I would be truly happy. If I had that job or this career path, if I had this amount of money in the bank, or if I was more accomplished or more attractive or more well-read or more well-liked, then I would be happy. And we end up believing the lie that if we just get our desires, then we will have meaning and significance and worth. If I just get what that thing it is that I really want, then I will have worth. But the text is reminding us that our desires are often deceitful. And sometimes it takes years before we realize how deceitful our desires are. How many of you have chased something for years, maybe decades, only to realize that you've been deceived by your own desires? And you begin to realize that deceitful desires are never going to give what you're actually looking for, that meaning and that identity and that worth. The scriptures, again, are saying something brilliant here. 
that your desires apart from Christ are actually tricking you. And the text is saying that the old way of being human is full of desires that are deceitful. And the text is also telling us to put off those old desires, that old way of being human. So let me ask you this question. Do you know your old way of being human? See, what I'm trying to get at is this. The new way to be human requires both an encounter with Jesus, learning Christ, who changes our desires, and a self-awareness of the old self and its desires. How will you put off the old way of being human if you don't have any self-awareness of the old human? How will you know what old habits and patterns and lies and stories and desires you need to put off if you have no awareness of your own story, of your sin patterns, of your own self? See, let me make what I'm trying to say abundantly clear. Do you know the old way of being human that you need to be taking off? Because remember, Ephesians is written to Christians. Do you have an awareness of the old self that you need to be intentionally taking off. The new way to be human requires self-awareness. See, let's talk about what's happening right now. See, I'm standing in front of you, preaching out of a desire to honor God and serve you. I genuinely want you to encounter Jesus and his word and to see the spirit of God at work. I want you to love him and follow him more deeply because I know that Jesus is the only way to the life that is truly life. And many times when I get up here to preach, I need to repent of all of the ways I preach for the wrong reasons. There's part of me that wants you to perceive me as successful and intelligent, but also winsome. So it seems like the success is coming naturally. Don't try too hard, because that would be embarrassing. Because there's a huge part of my old humanity, my story, that feasted on accommodation or affirmation and accolades. If I performed well, I got things. So any sense of my heart beating while the teaching text was being read did not fully emerge from a compassion for you and a desire to honor God, part of that adrenaline, yes, is God's gift to me, reminding me of the gravity and the importance and the significance of preaching God's word, and it reveals the ways that my heart is tempted toward the old way of being human, something I need to repent of and turn to the Lord. And many times I'm not always sure, which is what? See, I have this unconscious and sometimes conscious ability to project selfless love and hide the desire for success and achievement. So right here, even as I'm talking to you about Jesus, you've got selfless love and self-promotion all swirling around within me all at the same time. And just me acknowledging the unattractive parts doesn't make it disappear. It just names the ingredients of the inner stew that's within me, that resides within me. It just names the places where I need to put off and put on the new way of being human that's already been freely given to me. But what about you? What is that old way of being human that you need to put off? that old way that's enslaving you, that's tying you down, that's not leading to life that is truly life. Do you know? Where is the Spirit of God inviting you to put off the old way of being human? What the new way to be human often misses is both a genuine encounter with Christ and self-awareness. 
What are those old ways of being human that the Spirit of God is inviting you to put off? Because the Spirit of God wants to empower you to live a different kind of human life. And this is why we so desperately need renewal in Christ. Which leads us to our third point. We've seen what the new way to be human requires, a changed heart. We've seen what the new way to be human often misses, an encounter with Christ and self-awareness. But let's take a look at what the new way to be human looks like. Being renewed, 23, in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That old way, those old clothes, those are grave garments. They are not what we are to be wearing. The new way to be human is something that God has created in righteousness and holiness. And it looks differently. It looks beautifully different. It looks like putting on truth. 25, therefore, having put away or put off falsehood, let each one of you speak, to tr speak the truth to his neighbor, for we are all members of one another. The text says, put off lying and put on truth. Lying can be slight embellishment. Lying is presenting a view of myself that isn't reality. Lying is trying to manage my image because we're afraid of what others will think of us. We like to appear often a little more spiritual or a little stronger, or if the occasion calls for it, a little more humble. So what do I do? I project. I project what's actually the old way of being human, forgetting that the cross of Christ has already spoken the truth of who I am, that yes, I am morally compromised, I am broken, I am a sinner in need of saving, and the cross has equally spoken that for those who have trusted in him, you're new, you're his. So the gospel frees you to be a new kind of human that puts on truth. See, maybe one day, one day we won't have to say to one another, hey, let me just be honest. We might be able to say to one another, hey, let me just say something. Because we'll always be honest. We'll always be putting on truth. But then 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. There is a right way to be angry. Jesus got angry about the right things, but we often get angry about the wrong things. When we get angry, a chemical is released, it's like a shot of rage, like an adrenaline that gets you fired up. And in those moments, we often say things we later come to regret. We lash out. How many of you have learned that you can cause so much damage in a moment of anger. That if you would have just held your tongue, if you would have just waited, things might have turned out differently. See, there's an interesting word here used in 27. No opportunity. That word opportunity, or some of your translations might say foothold, is the word tapas. It's where we get the word topography. Don't give the devil a topos, a place, a foothold. It's a surveying term for, for someone to launch an invasion or a settlement onto a new piece of land. Where can we establish a stronghold or a foothold to launch our next attack? Where can we capture our first town in order to launch our conquest? We need a topos. And this is what anger does if left unchecked. That we're meant to be filled with grace and peace, but when anger gets in, the devil's like, aha, I've got in. I've got into their family. I've got into their marriage. I've got into their friendships and relationships. I've got a tapas. I've got a foothold. Now, from this vantage point of anger, what else can I unleash? Ooh, what about jealousy? Boom, military blitz campaign for jealousy. Now we got jealousy and anger cooking together. And the thing just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading, and it gets out of control. It's like a bad game of risk. It just never stops. And before you know it, what's your soul filled with? Rage and 
malice and slander and all the things that destroy community and relationships. Now, I need you to hear this. When we sin in our anger, the text is saying, spiritual powers enter in that create rifts within the body of Christ. If your anger is leading you to sin, we must repent. Your anger can introduce spiritual powers into the community of Christ that could take years to undo. That if you're sinning in your anger, you're giving satanic powers a stronghold. It will hinder the progress of God's people. Your family will suffer. Your relationships will suffer if your anger is unresolved. But for those of us who would repent and turn back to the Lord, the Spirit wants to begin the process of freeing you from the power of sinful anger. Because the Spirit of God has more for you. The Spirit of God wants to bring life and healing and transformation and not let you be held in bondage to the footholds and the strongholds that the enemy wants to bring. But this leads to the next thing the text says of what it looks like, the new way to be human looks like, putting on honesty and truth. 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Stealing is when I want something that I think I deserve that something, so I'll do what's ever necessary to get that something. And it's again rooted in the old way of being human because the old way of being human puts me at the center. Therefore, I'll do all any of the things that I want. I'll go after, I'll chase after, even if they belong to someone else. But the new way to be human puts Jesus at the center. I'm no longer my own. He died for me. And everything I think I own is actually a gift from him meant to be stewarded and used for the benefit of others. Which leads us to 29. The new way to be human looks like putting on speech that builds up. Let no corrupting talk come out of our, your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That word corrupt can be translated as rotten, like a rotten piece of fruit. Take off. Put off rotten speech and put on speech that builds up. Rotten speech is gossip. It's divisive language. It's any language that brings someone down. And the text is saying that as new humans, we are not allowed to talk like that in the body of Christ or anywhere. But you're like, I'm just processing. See, we live in this therapeutic age where we have this constant need to just want to process. But if you're processing rottenness, the church will suffer. The people around you will suffer. This church is centered on and built on the story of God's grace in the person of Jesus. And that we as Christians are new humans in that story. And we're to live out our humanity differently. When we unleash rotten speech, the spirit, the text says, is grieved. And when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we're only a step away from quenching the Spirit of God. And when we quench the Holy Spirit, well, that's a lifeless church and a lifeless Christian. Christians are called to speak in a way that's life-giving. What if you only spoke in such a way that lifted someone else up? What if the only thing that ever came out of our mouths was, like the book of Romans says, to outdo one another in showing honor? So I want you to see something about this section that we're looking at. Lying, the Bible says, is the devil's native language. Anger can potentially give a stronghold for the enemy. And stealing is a trademark of the devil. Jesus said that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and corrupting speech grieves the Holy Spirit. So get this. Spiritual warfare is not primarily about casting demons and principalities and powers out there in the world. Spiritual warfare, hear me now, is how we treat one another right here, right now within the body of Christ. It's about our speech. 
It's how we talk to one another. It's about how we don't let anger rule us right here, right now. This is what it looks like to live as new kinds of humans, which leads to the last thing the text says. The new way to be human looks like a community of forgiveness. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind, or be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The term bitterness is a word that has to do with a fire that looks like it's completely out. But if you poke it, the flames will start to ignite again. You poke it and realize that there's actually coals underneath. It's just sitting there smoldering. And if you add fuel to it, it'll take off. So deep within you, are there relationships where someone has angered you or wounded you and it seems fine? You might even say, hey, things are fine. But if you poke around, you actually begin to flare up. Is that true of you? Is there a person or a relationship or a circumstance that it seems fine if no one talks about it, but the moment that that person or that circumstance or that thing comes up, something stirs and bubbles up within you, that's what bitterness is. And the Spirit doesn't want you to have smoldering ruins in your life. He wants to give you his life-giving fruit. And this is why we need the mercy and grace of God. This is why this text ends by reminding us that God in Christ has forgiven us. See, friends, the new way to be human is impossible without Jesus and his forgiveness. Jesus is the only human being who ever lived a fully human life. He didn't give in to false identities. He didn't live from a place of insecurity or unsettledness. He lived from a place that was tender and soft and open to the Father's will. That the Bible says his nourishment was found in doing the Father's will. That he's the one who lives the truly human life that God intends each one of us to live, yet we perpetually fail to live. And Jesus lives that life on our behalf and dies on our behalf and on the cross absorbs the collective choices that we make in the old way of being human. All the ways that we give into bitterness and harshness of words and hardness of heart and anger, Jesus takes that into himself and offers back forgiveness so that his people can walk in a new way of being human, a community marked by forgiveness. See, the resurrection of Jesus becomes the moment right here in this broken world of sin and death where we see what the power of God is all about. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates that Christ, yes, is victorious over sin and death and that because of the finished work of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit, God has the power to take the most callous, hard-hearted, bitter, angry person and transform that person into a new kind of human, a human marked by love, that God's commitment to sinful humanity is so strong that in Jesus, he has the power to take each one of you and transform you into new kinds of humans, humans marked by the very presence and power of God, new humans empowered by God's spirit. See, if you are in Christ, God's spirit has sealed you. You are his. That identity cannot be changed. And again and again and again, throughout the book of Ephesians, Paul has reminded the church of the importance of the work of God's Spirit. It's as if to say that we're often functionally unaware of that which we have access to, that God's Spirit has sealed you and is empowering you, that it's possible to be a spiritual amnesiac where you forget your identity in Christ. You forget about the power of the Holy Spirit. You forget that the verdict over your life, if you're in Christ, is forgiven and justified, and that's already been declared before anything you've done as a Christian. It's possible for you to be functionally unaware of all these things, and that perhaps you're stuck 
Not because you don't have the resources you have but, or the resources you need, but because you're not paying attention to the resource you already have. The Spirit of God wants to remind you today that in Christ, you have the power and presence you need to live as new kinds of humans in God's project of renewing all things. So why wouldn't you want to come to him? Why wouldn't you want to rest in the loving gaze of your heavenly father? Why wouldn't you want to rejoice in the work that Christ has done? Why wouldn't you want to, instead of grieving the Holy Spirit, be led by and walk in step with the Spirit. If you are in Christ, you are sealed. You are his. Nothing can change that. And from that place, live out your new humanity. So Father in heaven, we ask, we ask and we pray that you would help us to live into this. We recognize that apart from you, we can do nothing. So would you forgive us for all of the ways, the different ways that we have the propensity to live into those old identities, that old way of being human? Forgive us for all the ways that we're just content with being stuck in old patterns. God, would you awaken us to the beauty of who you are? Would you captivate our minds and our imaginations that we would want to, from the inside out, live different kinds of lives? And so, Holy Spirit, would you do that work in us and through us? Holy Spirit, would you come and would you transform and would you bring healing? Set us free from the power of sin and help us to walk in newness of life. We pray and we ask these things in your name. Amen. And now, let all sinners who are grieved and humbled by their sin, let all the weak who need their faith to be strengthened, and let all who love the triune God yet wish to love him more, come now to the table of the Lord. The scriptures tell us on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it and said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Likewise, he took a cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And so having heard of God's grace, we come now to taste of God's grace. At this point in the service, we ask that each of you pause and consider the state of your soul. The Lord's table is for baptized, repentant Christians. If that does not describe you, we ask you to refrain from the table. If you have children who are with you and have not yet been baptized, they're welcome to process with you through the line but not partake of the elements. And if you've recently come to faith and have not yet been baptized, we'd love to baptize or talk with you and baptize you and then welcome you to the table. And if anyone is here and under the discipline of the church or living in hard-heartedness towards Christ, they too should refrain from the table. All those who are refraining are welcome either to stay in your seat or process through the line, but just pass by the elements. And in a moment for the rest of us, you'll exit out of the left side of the row you're sitting in from front to back and come to one of these four stations in the front. There, the server will place bread in your hands and speak a blessing over you. And then you're welcome to take a cup of wine or juice and make your, back, make your way back on the right side. If you're in the balcony, feel free to come to any one of these stations. And if you need a gluten-free option, there'll be that for you in the back. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, let's pray this prayer together on the screen. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, O Lord, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Being joined together in him, May we attain to the unity of faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. As this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant that your whole church may soon be gathered 
from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So now, let all who belong to Lord Jesus Christ be assured. It is his life and not yours that makes you fit for this table. Your sin and your weakness is covered by his grace. Christ welcomes his people to come and commune with him. Come now to the table of the Lord as you're ready.
By way of reminder, we'll have leaders available up front uh, to pray with you if you so desire. Uh, having gathered us now for worship, God sends us out as his people to live for his glory in the world. And remember, you've been given access to all the resources that are needed to live in that newness, that newness of life in Christ. So with that in mind, receive this benediction now as you go this morning. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit abide and remain with us now and throughout our time on earth until the day of his return. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.